Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast brought to you by BetMGM. This is our Group of Five Deep Dive. I'm Mike Calabrese, joined by Mike Ionello. And if we're feeling 10 feet tall, it's because we're coming off a phenomenal week eight. We hit our round robin. We hit the underdog money line parlay for the first time in. Let me check my watch, the sundial, like a year and a half. So it Ever. feels pretty good uh, to put it all together. I know I'll give it the game ball to you right away because you pulled a me, essentially, in the money line underdog parlay. You went gutsy. You went with Charlotte. And man, back in Biff worked out good, didn't it? The Fighting Biff Pogies, Saturday night, I was lighting up a stogie. My wife graduated from Alabama. She thought I was celebrating the Tennessee win. I said, no, honey, Charlotte just won. The Fighting <laughs> Stogies with Pogies, baby. I was That was a huge win. <laughs> there were some really great wins on Saturday, not just ours, but also I'm going to jump right into our G5 Hero of the Week. Jose Pisano for me, the place kicker for UNLV. Once you go specialist, you can't go back. This is you know two weeks in a row for me with a specialist. One thing about him, not only did he go six for six for UNLV, getting them to bowl eligibility for the first time since 2013, an, an incredible you know run and by UNLV, a team that we had been hoping for years would be able to put it together with their sideline slot machine, that turnover slot machine. All of it, all the vibes were great. They just couldn't get over the hump. They finally do it this year in Barry Odom's first year in Sin City. I love what they've done, but they needed him to make every kick, including the game winner. He was also three for three on kicks over 42 yards. And this is why I love this job. I was like, I should probably take a little deep dive on Jose Pisano. He's the same height as I am. I'm 5'9", 177 pounds on a good day. He's 5'9", 220. He's a big boy. And I went back. I was like, I don't remember him from UNLV last year. And it's with good reason. He wasn't at UNLV last year. He was an All-American kicker at Missouri State. I was like, let me just punch his name into YouTube, see if anything comes up. Oh, this was one of those great moments where you're panning for gold and someone comes up. He had a podcast with the punter on YouTube on a weekly basis called Bear With Us, because it was the Missouri State Bears, where they just basically shoot the shit and talk about life and what it's like to be really good specialists at the FCS level. And I found out he's a foodie and his number one thing to cook that all his roommates love, deep fried quesadillas. So Jose Pisano, a hat tip to you. Way to get UNLV back in the winning ways. And now they're a live dog. Not even a dog. They're the co-favorites at this point in the Mountain West. I'd love to see them ride it all the way to the Mountain West Conference title game. Geez, you have you have way too much time on your hands. The uh, Trent Dilfer press conference must have been short this week if you were going down to UNLV kicker YouTube rabbit hole. Uh, I love that pick. I actually, I, I did one of those things where I cheated and listed like three people so I could name them off because I was going to be like, yeah, you know, I thought about the UNLV kicker. I thought about, I mean, I obviously the first thing I thought of was the rice gummy worm guy. I mean, he would, he might just be G, like a life hero, not even the G5 hero. But instead, in honor of Halloween, I'm going with a ghost. Because if you look on the NCAA website, hopefully uh, David Payne can insert some spooky music. If you look on the NCAA website, it says Mohamed Kamara of Colorado State leads the country in sacks with 10 and a half. But no, no, no. It's Jalen Green of James Madison lurking in the shadows who actually has 13 sacks. He also leads the country with 18 tackles for loss. But you'd never know it because the NCAA is a joke. This dude is so good. Last week against Marshall, he had five sacks and five and a half tackles for loss in one of the most dominant defensive performances I've seen in a long time. And again, it doesn't count statistically, but if you watch that game, which I know we both did, he was an absolute wrecking machine on that defensive line. I can't remember the last time I've seen a player dominate a game that much from the defensive line. I mean, James Madison's finally ranked, but this whole thing about their stats not counting is a joke. I think James Madison needs to start pulling a Roman Reigns, and after every win, just tell the NCAA, acknowledge me. James Madison, Jalen Green, my hero of the week. NCAA, acknowledge them. I'm in the stretch run of my college fantasy football league that has an individual defensive player, and I was in the market for a new player, so I think you may have led me in the right direction. I currently have Owen Porter for Marshall, who's been very good. I do often. But when you when you mentioned five and a half tackles for loss, you have my attention. It's five sacks. That's absolutely insane. All right, 
I'm going to kick it to uh, a quick portion of our show that's a little bit new that I'm excited to talk about. Brett McMurphy does bowl projections every single week. And earlier in the year, you know, there's a lot of extrapolation and, you know, you're trying to look at what they've accomplished in a few games and what's down the pipe in terms of their schedule. But at this point, it starts to solidify a little bit. You can really see teams kind of locking in to being, you know, featured in one or two bowl games and particularly once teams like UNLV start to get bowl eligible, the, the whole picture comes into focus a little bit. What is a G5 matchup in his projection at this point that you're most excited to watch? Yeah, I was just looking down the, the list that he has, and he has currently in the Frisco Bowl, Memphis versus Georgia Southern. I think that could be a very fun, very high-scoring game. Uh, that one's a lot of fun. I know you want the Myrtle Beach Bowl, obviously. I know you, I'm sure you want to talk on that one, so I'll kick that one to you. But obviously, that's also a good one. But yeah, I think the, the Memphis Georgia Southern would be a fun just just all out shootout. Yeah, essentially when NFL fans are like, oh, college should be closer to the NFL in terms of the postseason structure, I, I've always you know rallied against that. But when you look at these minor in you know air quotes bowl games and you get a Myrtle Beach bowl matchup between a potentially nationally ranked James Madison who would move in if there's not enough bowl eligible teams and currently in in Brett's you know breakdown at this point there's two holes which means not only would James Madison move up but also Jacksonville State which is awesome and then in that matchup they'd be taking on Toledo that would be a matchup I would be really excited to watch I know that I, I've thrown a lot of shade at Taquan Finn but being able to see this James Madison team on a national standalone island game, I think would be really exciting. So I'm hoping that comes together for the Dukes. Also, wait, here's one more I just noticed. December 23rd, Calabrese. Which game would you rather watch on December 23rd? South Alabama against Jacksonville State or Utah versus Iowa? Oh, man. I, I guess I'm going with the first one. I... I think it's because I had higher expectations for South Alabama at the beginning of the year, although they're putting it together a little bit more week to week offensively. Yeah, with we that. may talk about that game. We may talk about that a little bit later. All right. <laughs> BBOC is presented by BetMGM. Use bonus code ACTION when signing up to get a $1,500 payback in bonus bets if your first bet loses. For new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, let us now turn to best bets. As I mentioned last week, we were white hot. We did split our best bets. And as you like to say, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of gamesmanship. You're moving the pieces around the chessboard. Is this really my best bet? Do I want to save it for the round robin? I'll get us started here. This bet is absolutely my best bet of week number nine. I love this one. You have a UConn team leaking oil, traveling to Chestnut Hill to take on the Eagles. BC laying under the key number of two touchdowns, minus 13 in this spot. UConn has waved the white flag. The season is over. It is toast. They are one and six. They just lost on homecoming to USF 24-21. They got roadies coming up against Tennessee and James Madison after this one. They're not winning out to get bowl eligible. It's over. Meanwhile, BC now four and three, probably the most low key winning team in, you know, the power five at this point, no one's talking about them, which is perfect. They've been pretty great since mid September. Remember they nearly upset FSU at home. They only lost that game by two. Now they've won three in a row, winning two on the road at army at Georgia tech. The Georgia tech win to me was an absolute statement win 20 or 38, 23 on the road in Atlanta. Tommy Castellanos is an absolute effing problem. This guy is the dual threat that they have essentially never had. Like they've been looking for consistent quarterback play ever since Sherkovic left. He had that one good year and then he was banged up, but they finally have a quarterback. He goes for 255, two scores, 128 on the ground, two scores against the Yellow Jackets last week. Up against a UConn team that was supposed to hang their hat on defense. They're not good. Our very own Brett McMurphy, as I mentioned, we're talking about the bowl projections. They're now projected to play in the Duke's Mayo Bowl. When I can get a Duke Mayo Bowl team, I'm riding with them. So I'm going to go with BC here. They're special on the ground. They are the most, number one with a bullet, explosive rushing team in America. They're ninth in explosive plays overall. I, I That just doesn't seem right coming out of my mouth talking about BC, but this is the team they are. And on the other side, they're not very good on defense. Usually it, it's a flip-flop. They're trying to win rock fights. Their defense isn't good. They're 113th in success rate, even worse against the pass. Luckily for BC, UConn cannot pass. 116th in success rate through the air. Last week against USF, who is not known as world beaters on that side of the ball, Taquan Roberson put up a QBR sub 30. 
He also have, has games of QBRs of 11.5 and 8.7. This offense stinks. This number is the way it is purely, I think, because of BC's recent history. And Jeff Halfley at home has not been a good favorite. Uh, they're four and seven against the spread in Halfley's tenure as a home favorite. But I think this number is off by, I would say, almost a full touchdown. If this was at 20, it would still be a lean for me. At 13, it's my best bet of week nine. I mean, I'm obviously not going to endorse it. Um, you know, I'm actually going to be home in Connecticut this weekend, so I'm sure not going to bet against the Huskies. But I do have a I mean, Boston it's College. It's a perfect time of year. Let's start talking UConn Huskies basketball. Like, you ah, know, yeah. in the front court, you know, are they going to be able to keep up with the, the national title pressure, everything else? But, yeah, it's time to move on from the football team in the Nutmeg State. I do have a BC win total over. I do also have a UConn one, but I think the BC one has a better chance at this point. So I'll, I guess I'll root for that one. Uh, for my best, like you said, the one the, we went seven and one last week. The one loss was my best bet. I'm going to blame it on the Gabbert injury. Unfortunately, Gabbert is out for the year. It looks like I think he broke his leg, ankle, something. Looked bad. Confirmed out for the year. Probably costs our Miami uh, MAC title futures. Unfortunately, as we talked about preseason, it was kind of dependent on Gabbert staying healthy. So that does suck. Um, but hopefully, I'll bounce back this week. I'm going. Speaking of bounce back. I'm going with Boise State minus four against Wyoming. Both the I think this is just the buy and low, or the lowest you're going to get Boise State. Both these teams are coming off a buy, but Boise State needed it a lot more than Wyoming did. Boise State was the overwhelming favorite to win the Ma- uh, Mountain West coming into the year. They're just three and four, but it's been a really weird year. They got crushed by Washington, obviously understandable. They lost to UCF on a walk-off field goal in a very weird game. They lost to Memphis by three, but I thought they outplayed Memphis that whole game, to be honest. I think I bet Memphis in that game and did not feel confident for a second. Then we mentioned it last week. They lost to Colorado State by one off a Hail Mary after they were up 20 with four minutes to go. So it's like their four losses are were all kind of weird. Obviously, the Washington one's understandable. Like I said, I think this is just the, the low end of the market on the Broncos. Taylor Green considered the best quarterback in the conference coming into the year. He's been essentially benched the last three games. The bye should have given them a chance to either figure out what's wrong with Green or or fully turn to Maddox Madsen. It sounds like they're going to stick with Green. Hopefully they were able to figure out whatever was going wrong with him during the bye or at least, you know, recraft the offense to fix him. Either way, Ashton Genty is, has been the best running back in the country. I mean, he's averaging 124 yards per game, 11 touchdowns. He's a monster. It looks like George Halani might be back. He's been practicing this week, so hopefully he'll return. But that's honestly just like a bonus to this offense. They don't even really need Halani. He's, I mean, they're already seventh in the country in rushing success. But he, I mean, he's probably better than the the other guy. A back, I forget his name. The backup. So at least it's just they'll be that much better. Their defensive numbers are bad, but again, like look who they played. They played Washington, UCF, Memphis, San Jose State, Colorado State. Like they have played a lot of very good offenses, especially good passing offenses. And we know Wyoming isn't great. Wyoming isn't great on offense. They they certainly don't have weapons on the outside to be afraid of. I'm not afraid of Andrew Peasley. Harrison Whaley's expected back. And he's good, but his knee injury looks pretty nasty. So obviously they had the week off, but who knows if he's 100. percent But this is not a normal Wyoming defense. They're 106th in success rate on defense. They're 121st in creating havoc. And the most concerning part is they're 95th at defending the run. And I just mentioned, that's what Boise does very, very well. App State put up 217 yards on them. New Mexico rushed for 225. Air Force ripped them for 356 yards on the ground. So I think this is a get-right game for Boise State. Coming off the bye, they still have a shot, an outside shot at the Mountain West. We mentioned they got you know Air Force, UNLV. They have to win this game. So coming off the bye, back at home, they should be able to run the ball on this defense. I'm going to back the Broncos to bounce back here at what I think is probably the low end of the market. So give me Boise State minus four. Gene T at this point has an opportunity to go down as one of the greatest single season G5 runners of all time. That's how good, that's the rarefied air. And it's not just like scheme. It's not just them giving him 40 touches a game. Like all you have to do is watch a single quarter of him playing and you're like, can this guy get in the transfer portal like mid season and go help somebody? Because like he, if he was on an Ohio state in that, that running back room, that's banged up, like nobody would blink. They'd be like, this guy deserves to be here and to be the starting running back. That's how good he is. So for anyone listening, who has not watched Boise state, like the guy is an absolute revelation. So I, I agree with you. I think this is the right side. Maybe it's just me being like a Homer, but like 
he almost reminds me of Saquon Barkley in the sense where every time he touches the ball, no matter where he is in the field, I'm like, he might score. You're like, if he breaks one tackle, he might score. Like every time he touches the ball, I'm like, he might score here. <laughs> so Mike, quick question for you. You know what everyone loves other than Gene T? What? Compliments. And compliments are guaranteed after making the leap to skincare with Caldera Lab. And I'm talking about how you look today and 20 years from now. The results are incredible in a very short period of time. Men's skincare and Caldera Lab are the perfect pair for you to look and feel your best. Super easy to add to your morning and nightly routine. Clear skin, less wrinkles, and signs of aging. Enough said. Caldera Lab skincare. Join the other 100,000 men who trust Caldera Lab to show your best first impression this fall. Caldera Lab knows the skincare world is heavily female-driven and has long been the wild, wild west for men. That's why they're making the solution simple, which is three easy steps. The clean slate, which is a face wash to start and end your day. The base layer, which is a daily moisturizer to hydrate your skin. And the good, which is an eye serum that you can put on at night to help your skin look tighter and smoother. And just for our audience, we have an exclusive deal. Use code BBOC at calderalab.com and get 20% off right now. That's 20% off with the code BBOC at calderalab.com. Make unforgettable first impressions with Caldera Lab. All right. The masses, they're clamoring. We're coming off the completion of a round robin. Let's get back into it. The G5 high five. Let's high five one more time. Rice plus 11 and a half against Tulane. I'm going to get it started here. I'm going to say this. We have been carrying, you know, Tulane's water since our very first episode. We love the green wave. We were rooting for them all the way through that Cotton Bowl classic win last year. Michael Pratt has been somebody that his name is echoed in the halls at the Action Network. But this Tulane team, to me, at this point, they just seem to like they're a little bit bored. They just like want to get through this stretch of their schedule. They're clearly the class of the AAC. They they could beat the doors off these teams, but they're just not doing it. They're one and three against the spread in their last four. They let UAB comfortably cover and rack up 434 total yards. North Texas more the same last week. You know, the mean green at 426 total yards and a comfortable cover. Those are not teams that should be hanging around that maybe if you know, one ball bounces their way. They could actually be tied late in the fourth quarter against Tulane. Tulane's so much better, but they continue to do this. And that's why I'm buying the Rice offense to score 30 plus in this game. And if they do so, getting an 11 and a half is just too good to pass up. The Owls offense, 32nd in success, 15th in explosive, you know, rating offensively. JT Daniels, absolutely dealing. He's thrown for over 340 yards and multiple touchdowns in three of his last four games. I understand their defense is bad. You can run up and down the field, but they're actually pretty good in the red zone. 17th in red zone scoring defense, Rice's this year. So I'm going to go ahead and take north of 10. I like it any number above 10. It's 11 and a half right now in the market. But there's just something about this Tulane team. And I, it makes sense to me from a human element of it, which basically says, like, we already proved last year that we were a bona fide top 15 team by beating USC. Aside from kind of sleepwalking through the second half against Ole Miss where that game got away from them and it, the final score wasn't indicative of how close it really was on the field between the Rebs and the Green Wave. Other than that, Tulane has been the Tulane team that we thought they'd be, but I just don't see them you know, going through. Essentially, they're going to go through the motions in a game like this. I think they win, let's call it seven, ten points. They probably get a decisive drive in the fourth quarter to put it away. But at this point, I'm kicking myself. I didn't take North Texas last week. I'm not going to miss the opportunity with this Rice offense. Yeah, I think this is one of those games. I, I feel like I've been wrong about. I feel like I've bet against Tulane like three times and been wrong every time. And I bet on them against UAB and lost. So I'll, I'm going to stay away just almost for your sake. But I feel like this is one of those games where you'll know if this will cover immediately, because I feel like JT Daniels like is either on or he's like really off. Like this is one of those games. We're like late in the fourth, Rice will be like winning by like three. And you're like, okay, either Tulane's going to score and win by four or lose. Or JT Daniels throws two early picks and Tulane wins by like 30. Like, I think this is one of those games you'll probably know pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's how JT Daniels is. Although, I, will, I will toss in the Rice offense on the ground has been, I mean, I know the Maybe. competition is not anywhere near Tulane. But they have been able to hit some plays and score some rushing touchdowns. So it's yeah, not Dean Connors. Went off. Dean Connors like tort. Would they play Tulsa last week? I don't know. Dean Connors torts whoever they played last week. Yeah. All right. We mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the bowl game. 
And I'm also going back to the well here. I'm thinking South Alabama minus 10 against Louisiana. As I said last week, Louisiana's just not that good. And their wins are pretty weak. And we both, we double dipped on the Georgia State win. I won my plus three. You won your money on underdog. I think South, that South Alabama has been able to get their swagger back over the last two weeks. And yes, they've played two crappy teams. But again, I don't think that highly of Louisiana. And at the end of the day, the way you kind of have to judge some of these games is like, We've seen it even at the Power 5 level. Everyone talks about, like, the non-con. It's like, okay, if you play crappy teams, crush them. And over the last two weeks, South Alabama has outscored ULM and Southern Miss 110 to 10. Like, that is good teams whooping bad teams. And this is a team we picked to win the Sun Belt before the year. And, you know, we, are, we saw them go on the road earlier and crush Oklahoma State. That looks better and better as Oklahoma State's playing well. They lost a weird game, a bad game to Central Michigan, bad loss. But, I mean, they outgained them by 150 yards. And they lost by thir- with 13 seconds left. And then they lost to James Madison, who's the best team in the country. So it's kind of like, is their schedule that bad? I think Carter Bradley has really gotten his confidence going. And Damian Webb is running like a man possessed. He has 12 rushing touchdowns this season, second in the country, only behind Blake Corum. Jaguars offense is 11th in the country in explosiveness. Like I said, they've scored 110 points over the last two games. They are humming. And we know this Louisiana defense is horrific. They're 120th in the nation defending the run. Webb is going to run all over them. And the only thing the Raging Cajuns have been able to do well is run the ball. And the South Alabama defense is 28th in the country against the run. Their defense has really been terrific since Kane Womack took over. And... They're really good at preventing finishing drives. So even if Louisiana is able to move the ball a little bit, I don't know how much they're going to score. South Alabama played last Tuesday. So they basically have a mini bye week. They had an extra four days to rest to prepare for this game. I think the Jaguars keep rolling here. And like I said, I'm just going to continue to fade Louisiana because I don't think they're that good. And based on what I've seen from South Alabama, they look like the team we thought they were to, uh, at the beginning of the year. So give me the Jaguars minus 10. I think they run away here. I, it's a pass from me just because watching the Georgia State game, you know, it, it, Georgia State raced out to a 20-0 lead. Then Granger gets banged up. He plays in the second half. He's clearly limited. They kind of went in a shell offensively. It almost cost them. I was impressed with Zeon Chris. That was his fourth career start. He kind of seems to me like a, a Sun Belt, like poor man's Anthony Richardson. Like when you look at what Napier did at Louisiana and then bringing that to Florida, you, you can just see – the scheme doesn't allow him to show his his full skill set. But there were some times he was shaking people in the middle of the field where defenders were full on diving in the wrong direction. Like he has gobs of talent. So I think if it's a situation where maybe a backdoor covers on the table and they just like, you know, let him open it up a little bit, he can, he has a huge arm. He can make big plays. He can also turn the ball over as he did critically at the end of that Georgia state game. So he's clearly a very raw player you know, just in the first few starts of his entire career. But that's the only thing that gives me pause because I agree with everything you said on the South Alabama side of things. Like their big three wide receiver, running back, quarterback, it's all humming. So I do see them scoring a lot in this game, but I'm just a little bit concerned because Zeon Chris, I think, is a difference maker that we'll probably talk about next year as, you know, they reposition themselves as a real threat to win the, the Sun Belt West. Uh, real quick, just take a little step back. Do you still think South Alabama wins the Sun Belt? I know we, we both were on them preseason. Do you still think they win it? I think Georgia State, if Granger is healthy, they're the pick that I think is going to get there because they get, they're get they the beneficiary of James Madison not being able to go to the title game. I think if they can get there, that's a team I would prefer to back over South Alabama. But I do think at this point, they're probably going to be the representative from the Sun Belt West. Troy's playing better too, but yeah, I agree. All right, I'm going to go with the team here that you alerted me to last week, and it's fading the East Carolina Pirates because they are an absolute corpse. They're like, so they're, bad. <laughs> they are just, this is a, an old school Sega Genesis hit the reset button. Like the season didn't go right. Just like, forget it, walk away from the system. They're God awful. And now UTSA is totally reborn with Dr. Frank Harris back in the saddle. They have an interesting running game to go with Harris. Kevorian Barnes and Robert Henry are both clicking. So it's not all on him. They're not nearly as explosive as they were with Zachary Franklin last year at wide receiver, but they have scored 126 points in three AAC games lately. That's 42 points per game. And they're up against an ECU team that can't move the ball at all. This may be the worst FBS offense. Like you teased that last last week and then watching the condensed game against Charlotte, there's not too many highlights to show in that condensed version. They're 130th in success rate. 
They had two quarterbacks throw 32 passes against Charlotte. Guess how many passing yards they had in that game? I know you were you had a vested interest, but did you see how many passing yards they had? I don't remember. I think it was it was like 56, right? Something like that. One quarterback had in the mid 50s. They finished with 88 <laughs> on 32 pass attempts. Like that's really hard to do in the year 2023. Like you would just think by happenstance they'd hit like a 25 yarder. No. They can play defense strangely well. That's the only thing that gives me a little bit of pause in a game like this with UTSA laying 19, the Roadrunners. But they're better are, against the run on defense. That, that's true. I, I think arguably overall they're a top three AAC defense, which is like a, a huge you know half-team situation. But I still see UTSA probably scoring 28, 31 points, and I, I don't see more than the touchdown for the Pirates here. UTSA at home in the Alamo Dome. I think they're rolling. They're moving towards another conference championship, so – I'm going to go with the Roadrunners. Meet me. Yeah, they uh, uh, ECU had 127 total yards in that game against Charlotte. It's like, I mean, like at this point, UTSA is just flipped the. They're switch. worse than Kent State. They're they're worse than Kent State. Yes, I, I agree. I know that uh, Bill Connolly and his SP rankings of every team from the number one in the FBS all the way to NAIA has Kent State as the worst FBS team. No disrespect to Conley, the Godfather of. Uh, College football advanced they're, analytics, but no, this is they're definitely they're they're definitely worse on offense. Like, like maybe yeah. you make the argument ECU's defense puts some ahead, like barely ahead of Kent State, but Kent State definitely has a better offense than ECU does. No, all right. What uh, else you got for the round robin? Speaking of lack of offense, it worked last week. We need we need to like coin a new segment. Just Mike's miserable Mac unders. I'm going back to the well. <laughs> Womp, 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 womp. It's, it's like you remember that like mike superstar show it's just like the depressing version of that it's just mike's miserable mac unders <laughs> uh western michigan eastern michigan under 46 46 is nuts this should be 41 and a half i've taken 42 41 and a half you're giving me a 46 i mean what are we doing here eastern michigan's offense has been a mess you actually were saying earlier that like you don't want to watch this team you probably won't have to because i don't even know that they will make a ball austin smith six touchdown passes five picks. He's completing 56% of his passes. Samson Evans is not the same back. He's averaging less than 50 yards per game. Eagles are 121st in success rate, 132nd in explosiveness. They get zero big plays. The defense isn't terrible. They're actually fifth in the country in success rate against the pass. I don't know how it's true. It's probably one of those stats where just like they haven't played anybody and nobody feels the need to pass the ball. But they're not great against the run, but you know they also don't, they don't give a big play. So I kind of am not super worried about the defense. And Western Michigan also stinks on offense. They've started three different quarterbacks this year. I believe they're currently going with your boy Hayden Wolf. Play the drop. The Wolf Pack is riding again. Your boy from Old Dominion. I know you loved him. All three quarterbacks have been bad. So I'm not, like, we're not really afraid of Hayden Wolf. No offense, Wolf Pack for for life. Uh, they generate no big plays on offense. They lost their entire offense to the portal last season. It, this was a complete start over. Their defense isn't great, but like I said, I think this is just another gross Mac under. I looked, it's going to be like eight, nine, 10 mile an hour wins. It, it, it's, you know, it's actually supposed to be pretty nice this weekend, but it's just, it's a Mac. It's probably going to be gross and windy just because it always is. It's also hard for us to make Mac picks since we record on Tuesday night and Next week, baby, Halloween midweek maction is back. So I had to get one last maction under while we still can, while we still can get them on the pod. But next week, Mike's miserable midweek maction unders are back, but we're going to take one more on a Saturday. Give me Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan under 46. If you're one of those lucky people that have like the TV setups in your man cave with like three TVs, if you bet this game, just go ahead and angle that TV right into the corner away from you. So you don't have to watch a single second. If you're at a sports bar and for whatever reason they have ESPN plus on with this game, just request that they put on the home shopping network. Like don't watch a second of this game. I think this is the right play. I think you just have to ride out these unders until it stops spitting out winners. And at this point we're not even close to that. So yes, let's yeah, have to do is next, next week, next week, You'll have to watch this because it'll be Tuesday. This is the last Saturday to just bet it. Don't ever look at it. Check your action ever gap and be like, perfect. They scored 12 points. Like last week was perfect because I had 41 and a half and they scored 41. And I just had to look at the end of the game and be like, perfect. Nailed it. <laughs> All right. Last week, it only took like betting against Utah State, what, five, six weeks in a row to finally hit a winner. But not only did I get the win with San Jose State, they won going away by 21. 
But I think I stumbled into a team that is going to be red hot down the stretch. As we know with the Spartans, they never retreat. They never surrender. They're laying 10 at <laughs> Hawaii, and I'm calling it right now. They're winning out. They were left for dead at 1-5. and five. I think they're going to finish the, the season at 7-5 and five and potentially on tiebreakers maybe get into the Mountain West title game. That's how bullish I am on San Jose State. Last two weeks, they murdered New Mexico, 52-24. As I mentioned, they dominate Utah State by 21. Kyrie Robinson is averaging 149 all-purpose yards and seven touchdowns in those three games. And the defense that was a total mess under Brett Brennan has forced seven turnovers in the past three games. And after being one of the least disruptive teams in the entire country from a Havoc perspective, they got 15 TFLs in the last three. A lot of this was predicated on the fact that they had that brutal opening schedule. They had USC, Oregon State, Toledo, Air Force, all these teams that have either been ranked or, you know, flirted with being ranked for most of the season. Hawaii is nowhere near any of those teams. Hawaii's trash. Their defense can't stop anybody. Four straight games, they've given up 40 plus, or sorry, three straight games, UNLV, San Diego State, New Mexico. So Hawaii's offense, don't get sucked into, you know, the the run and shoot. They are going to be able to score points. I understand that San Jose State's not going to pitch a shutout. They'll probably score 20, you know, maybe let's call it 28. San Jose State's going to keep this 40 point uh, string going. They're going to pump it in. And just a PSA, I know that there's a lot of rumors and myths about betting on the Hawaii games dating all the way back in the Action Network archives to 2003. Hawaii couldn't be more mediocre against the spread at home. They're 66, 67, and 5 against the spread. Also, as a home dog, dead on 50%. So no Big Island advantage. You know, Shout out to Kona Brewing Company. No Big Island advantage whatsoever. I'm going to go ahead and play the Spartans here at Lantern. Also, have you looked at like some of the names on the San Jose State roster? Like half these dudes are from Hawaii, so it's like a homecoming for them. They're probably gonna have more of their family in the stands than Hawaii's fans. I agree with you. I love this play. I think you know I was high in the Spartans preseason. Obviously, that didn't work, but I do think they're hitting their stride. Their their offense is really starting to click. Um, they've kind of been struggled that with you know I think they struggled off the bat with uh, what's his face Justin Lockhart you know, kind of being out for the year, but they've kind of that Nick Nash like the uh, converted quarterbacks and playing really well. I mean, I don't know about the win out looking at the schedule. I mean, they got Fresno State, UNLV. I'm, I will, I'm calling it right now. I, 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 it's, it's crazy, but I just uh, have this feeling. I'm that, calling it right now. You can go ahead and lock this in. It's my best bet in uh, two, 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 three weeks, November 18th. Uh, they are going to smoke San Diego State. <laughs> so go ahead and pencil that one in for me. Uh, yeah, I like it. I agree. I should text you saying that I was going to take this if you didn't. So I definitely, this is, this is my favorite play of yours this week. I love this one. All right, we are now on to the G5 Moneyline Underdog Parlay. Feeling feeling pretty good, feeling fresh after hitting it last week. First one on the season. It doesn't fully wipe away all the red on our sheet in this segment of the program, but it gets us pretty close to even. Pretty close. So at this point, let's play with some house money. Let's get it working. House money, house credit at this point. Um, let, let's hear yours first. I want to see if... I'm playing the Calibri's role with the long shot or if it's like certainly not me. I'll be honest. This was like the heart. I could not find even a remote one. I like, I don't, you gotta, we gotta have some sort of music to play here after this. I'm going so wimpy. I'm ashamed of myself. Go ahead and boo me. Oh, this is gross. Give me New Mexico plus a hundred against Nevada. I don't even know if that's legal. I think it's legal. I think that's fine. It's <laughs> below the minus 110 threshold. And to be fair, minus plus 280. So it's going to be a decent payout. Nevada finally got a win. A disgusting, ugly win last week over the, this abomination of a San Diego State team. They won 6 nothing. I think New Mexico State, or New Mexico is just still clearly the better team. Like, Nevada's terrible. They're 122nd in the country in offense. They're 130th on defense. They can't stop a nosebleed. Their quarterback has two touchdowns all year, six picks. Their offense is terrible. New Mexico's offense looks pretty good. You know, they're, they, they haven't played anybody, but they're 30th in the country in success rate. They're 25th in explosiveness. Dylan Hopkins, 10 touchdowns, four picks. They run the ball really well with Ja'Cory Krosky merritt and Andrew Henry. Henry has been kind of in and out of the lineup. He came back last week at 100 yards. Look, it's easy to say New Mexico's only beaten bad teams, but Nevada's a bad team. They're a really bad team. And I think at, at no point in this year did I ever think Nevada was better than New Mexico. So I don't even care. That, I mean, it's in Nevada, but what's that home field advantage worth? Half a point, maybe. So at the end of the day, I was looking through it, and I just looked at this game, and I said, 
I think New Mexico wins this game, and they're the underdog. So I'll take them as the uh, the little small pup here. I don't know. There's someone in the water. We used to clearly, between me, you, and Stuck, be like a, a Maction podcast, flying the flag. We had like the skull and crossbones. There's only two. There's only two Mac games this week, so it's a weird one. But like we're kind of switching over to becoming a Mountain West pod because this is my <laughs> underdog. I like UNLV plus two eighty to upset Fresno. Woo! Listen, I am not gonna sit here and say the Fresno is not a good team. They're absolutely a good team. I like like their defense a lot. But they are propped up by wins over Purdue and Arizona State, which a month ago everybody was like, you know, they got these power five wins. Purdue's two and five. Arizona State's one and six. Neither of them are any good. Fresno lost to Wyoming. They needed a touchdown in the final minutes and an interception at their own nine yard line to escape Logan, Utah with the win against Utah State. What I'm saying is they are both good and they are beatable. And UNLV couldn't be riding higher. As I said, first time they're bowl eligible in a decade. And it's pretty rare for me to look at Colin Wilson's power rankings and take issue with where they're, they're slotted. He has Fresno State 64th. That's within about four or five slots of where I have him. He has UNLV 103rd. UNLV is not the 103rd best team in the country. Absolutely not. UNLV is a good rushing team. They're 13th in explosives on the ground in Brennan Marion's go-go system. Defensively, they can stop the run, which is critical against this Bulldog team. Fresno, it's probably going to go with Logan Fife again. I think Mikey Keene's questionable or a game time decision. I yeah, just pulled it up. Uh, Tedford on Monday said no clear updates on Mikey Keene. I think it's going to take the full the full two weeks to figure out where they are. Him and Lavelle Bailey, who's probably their best defender or well, one of their best defenders. So that's yeah. Yeah. So if we get Logan Fife, he's OK. He's nothing special. He's a jag, just a guy. So they're going to rely on the run game. And I know UNLV is decent there. And then when it comes down to special teams, we talked about Jose Pisano just making every single kick. S&P Plus has UNLV's special teams 32nd, Fresno 56th, a slight advantage there. And as a true Mountain West junkie, I'm going to have a little coming out party for me here. I am an absolute Mountain West junkie. I love staying up. It's a Friday night, Saturday nights, watching these games. And, you know, the Pac-12 is going away. So this is going to be the Mountain West after dark. UNLV always plays Fresno close when they visit the San Joaquin Valley. 2015, three-point Fresno win. 2017, UNLV wins in an upset by 10. 2019, Fresno wins in a blowout. But 2021, Fresno wins by eight. They always play these guys tough. I think they're a live dog here. And last year in Vegas, by the way, when these two teams played, it was tied midway through the fourth quarter. And that's with your man crush, Jay Kaner, leading the Bulldogs. Fresno won that game by seven. I think everything's pointing UNLV here. Like I said, house money, already bowl eligible. They got to be feeling great about themselves escaping with that win. You know, Colorado State bangs home a 55-yard field goal. They still get off the mat and find a way to have a game-winning drive. I am on the run in Rebs. Let's go plus 280. I like it. I think UNLV is consistently – like, to me, this isn't a bet, like, against Fresno. It's more just, like, right. UNLV is good. It's basically the exact opposite of what I did last week, where I was like, here's a dog shit team playing a dog shit team. They could win. You're like, it's a good team playing a good team, and the good team could win. Yep, th- th- that's it, and I think – like I said, if it's Logan Fife, I've seen I've seen him play enough that I know he's capable of having one of those games where he has like 35 attempts but only 20 completions. And like you're looking at the box score, it's like, like he did nothing. It was just a yards. nothing burger of a performance. <laughs> like maybe one pick kind of thing. So I don't know. Just plus 280 seems way out of whack for me. And like I said, a lot of advanced metrics view these teams really far apart. And obviously based on the sports books you know, money line and spread in this one, they view it the same way. I just think there's not been enough, you know, recalibrating based on what UNLV actually is on the field. And the last piece of it, I still don't think UNLV's played their best game offensively. They have the perimeter weapons. Um, I think, you know, Ricky White in particular could eat in this game. So I'm going to go ahead with them and put it together with your <clears throat> plus 100 underdog edition. And hopefully we get that <laughs> to the window with another winner. Yeah, it's one of those, they're one of those teams where like, you always have to like think about the power ratings um, of like, it's almost the same argument I made last week with Charlotte and uh, ECU where it's like, you have to think about where they would have started in, pe- in people's power ratings. And like UNLV started so low and Fresno state was one of the higher G five teams. And you're like, okay, every time UNLV wins, they probably get bumped up three or four spots in people's power ratings. So it's like, they're, they're just going like this and you know, is that indicative of where they currently are or is it just the pace they're moving at? Yeah. I, I think it's just, you're, you have two good teams and you're betting a good, that the good, uh, one of the good teams may win. I don't hate it at all. 
I'm going to give you a chance to plug the new BCS show because you were just mentioning how much you love it and listening to it. Like give a pitch to someone who has not listened to it on the feed, the recap show every Tuesday. Why should they get into it? I love it because it's the, I mean, anyone who listens to Colin Stocky, you know, all those guys, like they're two of, if not the two smartest people in the world of college football. And my always thing is like, sometimes I just want to hear what their thoughts are of the sport as a whole, instead of like their take on a game, their bet. And then you throw in, you know, Brett McMurphy, who is big J journalist to the max. And then you throw in, you know, Tim's brought such a new dynamic where he is kind of, I, I mean, this as the biggest compliment ever. Like he's like the everyday sports fan where he's just like the guy at the bar who gets the opportunity to ask these brilliant minds questions that like I'm thinking on my couch, Tim gets the chance to ask. I'll even text him sometimes like, Hey, you got to ask him this question. Cause I'm like, I want to ask him it. It's awesome. I love it. It's just like, it basically just like the kind of a take a step back. I almost wish we could do it more with the G5 where we can kind of take a step back and be like, Hey, how did this win or loss affect, you know, who's going to win the Sun Belt? Uh, they do it. They do such a good job. It's so much fun. I think it kind of lets them all relax a little bit and they're more silly and funny. I love when Tim says something dumb and Stucky just dunks on him. It's yeah. I mean, awesome. basically the vibe is like the scene from Goodfellas with like, I thought you said I was all right, Spider. Like, they just like, start yelling. I'm like, go get me a drink. Like, he's just like, he's trying to work his way through with three yeah. guys who can be a little prickly. So it is phenomenal. I just love that dynamic. I think he does a it's great so job. Funny. It's not easy to be, you know, running point in a show like that, but he makes it, he makes it fun. And I think it, a, a dynamic that, as you said, so much expertise, like just listening in, it's fascinating. The things that they get into, the look ahead lines, like when they're able to zoom out on the sport a little bit. I agree with you. It's phenomenal. A reminder to our audience on Thursday, it's stuck. It's Colin running through their full FBS card. It's about 90 minutes. They get into every single game. It's not just the marquee matchups. It's also getting into those awesome situational spots that stuck sees with such like laser clarity. Um, and then obviously the live show on Saturday, BBOC live with McMurphy, Colin Stuckey. I parachute in with my G5 pick of the week as well. And then the recap show at the end of the week. So it is a full buffet and college hoops is right around the corner as well. So we're going to fit in even more content um, getting in there in November as we start to look at some of the, uh, the marquee games. We got that Kansas, Michigan State, Duke, Kentucky doubleheader night. Um, so we'll get into some of that as well. So one game I wanted to ask you about that I like kept going back and forth on. I have no idea who it's just a just a who do you think wins kind of thing. Georgia State, Georgia Southern. I think it's a very interesting game Two very different. Uh, styles obviously if Georgia State wants to run the ball Georgia Southern wants to throw the ball I think I, I my phone died I think this game's on Friday night um, so this is kind of a fun standalone game that I think will be entertaining I'm curious your thoughts if you have a play if if you have a feeling of who wins this game it's also kind of a like low-key important game in the Sun Belt so I'm very interested on your take on that this is a very important game this is actually on Thursday night on ESPN Thursday two night. Yep, Thursday night. Um, I knew it was a big day because I watched Wire to Wire, it was the last leg of a bunch of parlays for me on Saturday night, that Georgia State-Louisiana game. I, I haven't seen a team that I ended up not being a horror story for me play an A first half and an F second half and still skate with a victory. But clearly, Granger, you know, it looked as though when he went into the injury tent, they were going to pull him. The backup quarterback I was kind of over his head in terms of, you know, the game plan and being able to just step in on the fly because I don't know Granger's status in terms of how he's going to play. Cause up until that moment, really he'd come in just red hot. He was protecting the football. He was a dynamic runner. He was orchestrating the offense perfectly, just throwing enough to keep teams from stacking the box because of that. I'm leaning Georgia Southern in this game. Um, but really it's kind of a stay away from me just because this is a heated rivalry. Statesboro is a place that I, strikes fear into me. I love backing them as dogs you know, at home, it looks like they're actually now like a one point favorite. Yeah. It's crossed over there. A one point favorite. So I think the market is kind of agreeing with me here that this could be a hornet's nest for Georgia state, a game that they need to win. I don't even think this is arguable in terms of its overall importance. They got to win a game like this. If they're hoping to get to the Sun Belt championship. It's a tough matchup. When you look at Georgia state, we talked about it last week with the Louisiana game, their strength is defending the run. They are leaky against the pass, which is obviously all Georgia Southern wants to do. I agree with you. I, I've said this before. I don't trust Davis Brin, so I like Granger more. But you mentioned his health, and then it's just can that Georgia State slow down the Georgia Southern passing attack? Like I said, I'm I'm probably not going to bet it either, but I'm very excited to watch it. I think it'll be a fun game. So I did just want to mention it. 
uh, for those G5 fans. Hopefully people will be watching this Thursday night because it should be a very fun game in the in the fun belt. Last one, cutting room floor for me. Sun Belt West, we talked about South Alabama, but Troy, Texas State, the winner there has an inside track to at least make it interesting, if not take the Western Division title outright. This is interesting to me from a total perspective. I haven't played a lot of totals in the last few weeks, but I like over in this spot because I think Texas State's defense is just not very good. Sitting at 53 and a half plus, G.J. Kenny got a bye week to look at this Troy defense that's been gradually improving week over week over week. Can he get the offense firing up again with T.J. Finley, you know, um, Mahdi at running back? Like, he's got a lot of weapons. He clearly has presented a diverse offensive package on film, so it's got to be difficult for Troy to break this thing down as well. I think over's the play here. It could be something if uh, I'm looking at the kickoff time. Yeah, it's 7 p.m. If I'm having a good start to the Saturday, I think I'll just tag this on as one extra play. Yeah, uh, Troy's been running the ball really well with Badal recently. They, they finally got him going. The only one I had, I, I don't know if I'll play it, is SMU starting to get into that flex their muscles. Minus mm-hmm. 20 against Tulsa at home. They they might, they might we saw him truck Temple. I think they're the type of team that I think can run it up quickly. So it's a big number, but that one kind of piqued my interest a little bit. We're, we're, the Stone Age is really starting to, to get rolling here. I agree with you on offense with Stone Age. Defensively, like Temple not having EJ Warner, it's like they, they had no offensive game plan whatsoever. So like, yes, it was impressive that they won, you know, the way that they did, but I wouldn't put too much stock in their defensive numbers. And I think Tulsa offensively, depending which quarterback they go with or if they play both, I think they could be a little feisty in that spot. So I'm glad that was yeah, kind of that's kind of why I stayed away, to be honest, but I thought of it. All right, for Mike Ionello, I'm Mike Calabrese. This has been the Group of Five Deep Dive under the Big Bets on Campus banner brought to you by BetMGM. Thank you so much for listening. Please, as a reminder, subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe again. Leave those (laughs) five-star reviews. As a reminder to our audience, if you hit us with a five-star review, mention us by name. Happy to throw you a $10 parlay of your choosing. I'm going to kind of force your hand and make you use some of our picks, or at least G5 picks. But um, it makes for some fun interaction. I'm happy to do that slide into my Twitter DMs at East Breeze, and we can get that done for you. All right, that's it for us. Enjoy the weekend. And as Ionello pointed out, midweek action back next.